Good morning. Welcome to Francis Bacon and Eggs. This will be the first session where I will read Francis Bacon and make some eggs. I'm pretty excited about it. I hope you are too. First step, let's get some eggs. Here we are, good eggs. Currently on the paleo diet, so I'm eating a lot of these and will be for some considerable amount of time. Let's turn up the heat. Yes. Now I'm gonna add some olive oil to my cast iron. Generally you should keep your cast iron with a bit of oil on it. Otherwise the iron can rust small bits. I like to use a square spatula with my eggs, like so. It's better to keep the uh, small inconsistencies in the iron scraped so that there's less likelihood of rust getting in there. I'm just going to let this heat up for a while. I have it on a medium. And uh, let's get into some Francis Bacon. Since this is the first episode, I figured I would actually start with the introduction and then move straight on to the first of many essays. This book, one of his many books, it's called Essays and Bell's Letters by Edinburgh New University Society. I bought it for 50p down the road. So, an introduction to Bacon's essays. In 1597, Bacon published a small volume dedicated to his brother Anthony, containing, among other things, ten of his essays. In 1612, he reprinted them, increased in number to 38, and dedicated to his brother-in-law, Sir John Constable, death having overthrown his first intention of dedicating them to Prince Henry. In 1625, he again issued them, now 58 in number, and dedicated to the Duke of Buckingham. It is interesting, in reading the deliberately recorded opinions of a great man, to know whether they belong to his earlier or later life, and how far they were influenced by contemporary history. At the head of each essay, therefore, the date of its composition has been placed. It would be a work as superfluous as presumptive to put before the reader any commendation of the study of Bacon's essays. They are not only remarkable, but unequaled for their conciseness, their pertinence, their practical suggestiveness, their vivacity, even when treating of trite subjects, and their comprehension, sorry, their compression of many thoughts into the smallest possible compass in words. No student can satisfactorily paraphrase them without expansion. No annotator can adequately elucidate them without himself writing essays upon their various points. This is followed by a longer section about the life of Lord Bacon, which I will read on a later date, seeing as how I want to get straight into essays, civil and moral. Looks like we're getting there. It's a bit warmer. I'm going to put a bookmark in here. I'm going to use my bread knife. Anything will do for a bookmark. Whatever you have at hand. Sausage. Ham. I really like olive oil. It's quite good. Alright. So, this is flowing pretty well. I'm going to make sure. There we go. Pretty even plating. I haven't washed this recently. I generally don't wash my cast iron because I use it every single day, around three times a day. Um, looks like this should be some ham from yesterday. Good. Let's crack one egg in there. I haven't eaten this morning. I had a smoothie earlier. Lovely, with coconut milk. But uh, that was a few hours ago, so I'm going to have around three eggs today. I never learned how to crack with two hands. Can you believe that? But maybe I should have seen as I just dropped some shell. All right, so now we have some eggs. It's good, three eggs. I'm going to try and make them, I think, over easy today. Just before... They're there too much. I'm going to put some salt in. Some ground pepper. And I think 
today, I would like to have some rosemary. Seasoning salute, basil, paprika, red pepper, oregano. Oh, there you are. Bit of a messy kitchen at the moment. This looks great. All right. Here we have some eggs. Now, as says civil and moral. One, of truth, published in 1625. What is truth? Said jesting Pilate, and would not stay for an answer. Certainly there be that delight in giddiness, and count it a bondage to fix a belief, affecting free will in thinking as well as in acting. And though the sects of philosophers of that kind be gone, yet there remain certain discoursing wits, which are of the same veins, though there be not so much blood in them as was in those of the ancients. But it is not only the difficulty and labor which men take in finding out the truth, nor again that, when it is found, it imposes upon men's thoughts, that doth bring lies in favor, but a natural though corrupt love of the lie itself. One of the later schools of the Grecians examineth the matter, and is at a stand to think what should be in it, that men should love lies, where neither they make for pleasure, as with poets, nor for advantage, as with the merchant, but for the lie's sake. But I cannot tell, this same truth is a naked and open daylight, that doth not show the masks and mummeries and triumphs of the world half so stately and daintily as candlelight. Truth may perhaps come to the price of a pearl, that showeth best by day, but it will not rise to the price of a diamond or carbuncle, that showeth best in varied lights. A mixture of a lie doth ever add pleasure. Doth any man doubt that if there were taken out of men's minds vain opinions, flattering hopes, false valuations, imaginations as one would, and the like, but it would leave the minds of a number of men poor, shrunken things, full of melancholy and indisposition, and unpleasing to themselves? One of the fathers in great severity called Posey Vinum Demonum. Turn this down a bit. Looking very, very good, actually. I might actually just make them uh, sunny side up. Because it filleth the imagination, and yet it is but with the shadow of a lie. But it is not the lie that passes through the mind, but the lie that sinketh in, and settleth in, that doth the hurt, such as we spake of before. You know, I'm going to need a plate. Out of larger plates. Let me check the dishwasher. The bottom of the Clean dishwasher. The best. Great thing about Francis Bacon is you can just pick him up and read him whenever. He ages quite well. And uh, his thoughts are pretty lucid. You can get the brunt of an argument pretty quickly. Perhaps I should have cleaned it and just broke a yolk. <sighs> we have at least one here. Doesn't this look good? Two. Chuck is a bit of a hard jerk. Just gonna scrape some of this off. Leave that there for later. Put the eggs away. Do I want anything to go with them? No, I think I think just some eggs today sounds good. Grab a glass of water. And I'm gonna pour myself. Some of this coffee, which is still hot. Can't have eggs without coffee. Beautiful eggs. So we have these eggs. 
Look delicious. Where was I? But it is not the lie that passes through the mind, but the lie that sinketh in, and settleth in it, that doth the hurt, such as we spake of before. But howsoever these things are thus in men's depraved judgments and affections, yet truth, which only doth judge itself, teacheth, that the inquiry of truth, which is the love-making or wooing of it, the knowledge of truth, which is the presence of it, and the belief of truth, which is the enjoying of it, is the sovereign good of human nature. That's delicious. The first creature of God in the works of the days was the light of the sense, the last was the light of reason, and his Sabbath work ever since is the illumination of his spirit. First, he breathed light upon the face of the matter, or chaos. Then, he breathed light into the face of man, and still he breathes and inspireth light into the face of his chosen. The poet that beautified the sect that was otherwise inferior to the rest saith yet excellently well. It is a pleasure to stand upon the shore, and to see ships tossed upon the sea, and pleasure to stand in the window of a castle, and to see a battle, and the adventures thereof below. But no pleasure is comparable to the standing upon the vantage ground of truth. A hill not to be commanded, and where the air is always clear and serene, Bacon adds parenthetically. And to see the errors and wanderings and mist and tempest in the vale below. So always that this prospect be with pity, and not with swelling or pride. Certainly, it is heaven upon earth to have a man's mind move in charity, rest in providence, and turn upon the poles of truth. To pass from theological and philosophical truth to the truth of civil business, it will be acknowledged, even by those that practice it, not that clear and round dealing is the honor of man's nature, and that mixture of falsehood is like alloy and coin of gold and silver, which may make it, which may make the metal work the better, but it embaseth it. For these winding and crooked courses are the goings of the serpent, which goeth basely upon the belly, and not upon the feet. There is no vice that doth so cover a man with shame as to be found false and perfidious. It's one of my favorite words, perfidious. And therefore Montaigne saith prettily, when he inquired the reason why the world of the lie should be such a disgrace and such an odious charge, another great word, saith he, I wish you could enjoy these eggs with me. They're quite spectacular. Mm. You can just taste the rosemary. Not too much. It is well way to say that a man lieth, is as much as to say that he is brave towards God, and a coward towards men. For a lie faces God and shrinks from man. It's pretty badass. Surely the wickedness of falsehood and breach of faith cannot possibly be so highly expressed as in that it shall be the last peal to call the judgments of God upon the generations of men. It being foretold that when Christ cometh, he shall not find faith upon the earth. Then we have a lot of notes, which I will skip. Blah, blah, blah. Lots and lots of notes. So what have we talked about today? Well, at the end of every chapter, they have a short analysis of the essay. So I'll read that to you now, if you don't mind. So first, some men care not for truth. Anciently, they were philosophers. Now they are discoursing wits. It's a great insult. Discoursing wit. You discoursing wit! Be gone! It's good. The reasons for this is the difficulty and labor of finding out truth, and the obligations it imposeth upon the conduct, and a natural preference for lying, because truth would expose too many shams, and falsehood gives a pleasure to imaginations. It's true. Do not the poets say that. Yet truth is the sovereign good of human nature, being the perpetual creation and gift of God and the only secure resting place for men, as Lucretia says. So the truth of civil business, i.e. moral truth, is universally allowed to be honorable, as lying is a disgrace, so saith Montaigne, and will be the last peel to call down divine judgment. And there you have it. 
This has been the first episode of Francis Bacon and Eggs. I will probably get through this entire book and a whole lot of eggs before I finish. I'm going to enjoy the rest of these. You have a good day. Mm. Delicious.